Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for arriving for an early uh, event. We were just discussing the uh, nightmarish traffic uh, out there, um, which we all had to deal with. So thank you very much for, for coming. Um, this is an event that uh, I've been thinking about for a while. My name is Sean Ade, and I'm the, uh, not only a professor here at GW, but I'm the director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. And we do a number of things at IPDGC, including learn how to say that without it sounding funny. Um, and, uh, um, but we do a lot of events, and big and small. And one of the things that um, has been on our radar for a while is, is today. Um, as an academic, I was talking to Mary Ellsberg about this a minute ago. Um, as an academic, I'm very interested in how institutions change and how policy changes and how much that has to do with individuals and how much that has to do with individuals ability to change institutions um, and that's going to be really the subtext I think of a lot of what we're talking about today um, before we get started a couple of housekeeping things I, I mentioned Mary and I want to thank Mary and the Global Women's Institute here at GW for co-hosting this event with us um, this is the second event we've done together in her uh, short tenure here so far, and uh, she's wonderful to work with, as many of you know, since many of you know her. Um, I also want to say that we are live tweeting this event, and if you have any interest in, in tweeting yourself about it, use the uh, hashtag IPDGC, so Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Um, and also, of course, please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate or mute or whatever it is you want to do so they don't uh, make obnoxious noises in the middle of important points and that sort of thing. Um, I want to get us started very quickly with our wonderful uh, uh, keynote speakers. Um, ambassador Milan Verveer was President Obama's first ever ambassador at large and director of the State Department's Office for Global Women's Issues. Before being appointed to her position with the State Department in 2009, Verveer served as chair and co-CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnership an international nonprofit that invests in emerging women leaders and promotes human rights. Prior to her work with Vital Voices, Verveer served as assistant to the president and chief of staff to the first lady in the Clinton administration and was chief assistant to then first lady Hillary Clinton. Ambassador Verveer is the new director of Georgetown University, but we won't hold that against her, Georgetown University's <laughs> Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Um, and we're very, very lucky uh, to have her join us today. Um, after Ambassador Revere speaks, uh, Ambassador Donald Steinberg uh, will be coming up to the podium. He serves as Deputy Administrator at USAID, providing overall direction and management for the agency. His areas of focus include the Middle East and Africa, reforms under USAID Forward and the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, integration and mainstreaming of gender and disabilities into agency programming and enhanced dialogue with development partners. During his nearly 30 years with the government, Steinberg served as der, has served as director of the State Department's Joint Policy Council, White House Deputy Press Secretary, National Security Council Senior Director for African Affairs, Special Haiti Coordinator, and U.S. Ambassador to Angola. He has also worked with the Women's Refugee Commission, the United Nations Development Fund for Women, and the Institute for Inclusive Security. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Verveer to the podium. Thank you so much, Sean, and good morning, everybody. It's terrific to see so many former colleagues from the State Department here, and I welcome all the good men who have joined the women here this morning. Um, I'm accustomed to coming to GW from over at the State Department, and I think this is the first time I've returned from just across the way from Georgetown, so it is uh, a delight to be back here. And I must say, it is particularly personally rewarding for me to have Deputy Administrator Steinberg here with us. He has done so much in the space that we're discussing today, uh, and to have had someone and continue to have someone like himself uh, at the highest levels of government working on these issues as an extraordinary champion has really moved the needle rather significantly. So Don, for all you've done, for all you continue to do, deep personal thanks, and thanks of everybody who cares about these issues. Speaking of thanks, I think uh, GW uh, it is owed huge applause for bringing us together this morning uh, for this discussion on the legacy and impact 
of Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State in advancing uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. We continue to see the practical application of the policies we're discussing here this morning every day in the work of the State Department, even as we gather here to discuss it as legacy and to weigh its historical uh, impact. In so many ways, I don't think it was a surprise that Hillary Clinton made advancing women and girls as a key component of U.S. Secretary, uh, a key component of U.S. foreign policy uh, as she took on the role of Secretary of State. It was almost 20 years ago at the fourth UN Conference on Women that took place in Beijing that she made her historic speech in which she proclaimed for all the world to hear, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. As she said then, I believe it is time to break the silence. It is time to say here and now for everyone to hear that it is no longer acceptable to discuss women's rights as separate from human rights. And she detailed a litany of abuses waged against women around the globe, from rape as a tool of war to human trafficking, from child marriage to domestic violence, from dowry burnings to honor killings. And as she mentioned each one of the abuses, she said, this is a violation of human rights. Now Beijing sparked a movement around the world and it generated a call to action for women's access to education, to health, to be free from violence, to participate fully in the economic and political lives of their societies, to enjoy the fullness of legal rights. Hillary Clinton was at the forefront of that movement as First Lady, giving voice to women around the world who were on the front lines of change. She traveled during those years to some 70 countries and she promoted new investments in the United States initiatives, uh, particularly through USAID, in girls' education, in microcredit, in the kinds of development tools that we take for granted today, which not that many years ago were still fairly innovative uh, in this space. I remember when she keynoted the UN Social Development Summit, which was new space for her to be active in uh, before she had really played much of a role on the global stage as First Lady. And a few years later, the head of the UN Social Development Summit said to me, we all marveled because she ascended the platform at that summit as the First Lady of the United States. And when she descended the platform, it was clear to all of us that she was a world figure in her own right. So again, it was no surprise coming to the State Department that these issues would loom large because she understood them uh, in many ways as no one else had. As First Lady, she also led the State Department's Vital Voices Democracy Initiative, which recognized that emerging women leaders, whether in the former Soviet Union or in so many places around the globe in the 90s who were taking their place, uh, that they were critical in building uh, the new democracies and building robust civil societies that would serve their nations and our own nation well. Now, a platform for action was drawn up in Beijing that over 189 countries uh, subscribed to by consensus. I'm not sure we could do that today, uh, but it was a robust platform and it was a blueprint against which uh, we measure ourselves today uh, as we look at how we're doing uh, in improving the lives of women and girls around the globe. 
Today, there is certainly greater recognition that women's empowerment must be a central component of any effort uh, to address our global challenges. You know, we're going through a process now uh, to assess the Millennium Development Goals, uh, and those were, uh, those were drawn up uh, to address how we're doing to alleviate poverty around the globe. And one of the, globe, one of the goals, MDG3, is about gender equality and women's empowerment very specifically. And we recognize that we can't possibly solve the other goals, whether they have to do with the environment or with poverty or with hunger, unless that goal itself is one in which greater progress is being made. And I'm going to leave it to Don, as I'm sure he will, uh, to really focus on the development aspects of what this investment uh, and policy priority represents. Because it does remain a simple fact that no country can get ahead if it leaves half of its people behind. Or as Secretary Clinton very succinctly described the stakes until women around the world <clears throat> are accorded their rights and afforded opportunities to participate fully in the lives of their societies, global progress and global prosperity will have their own glass ceiling. So with the strong leadership of the Obama administration uh, and she at the uh, helm of much, much of this effort, empowering women and girls has become a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy because it is first and foremost in the vital interest of our country to do so. The position I held as the first ever U.S. Ambassador for Global Women's Issues was a recognition that we had to integrate gender in the full range of the works of the State Department. Uh, whether that meant in security, whether it meant in the political military parts of the department, whether it was in the regional bureaus, whether it had to do with promoting economic statecraft and improving uh, economic growth around the world, whether it had to do with climate change or it had to do with safeguarding human rights. All aspects of our diplomatic mission. This was not meant to be an office that stood by itself, uh, that did nice projects now and again that everybody could subscribe to, but it was meant to be integrated, its work, the lens of gender to be integrated in everything that the State Department does and continues to do. Because once that was achieved, and, and is applied every single day, the outcomes of the work of the department would be that much more effective. Or as the secretary never ceased in saying during her four years at state, this is not just the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. It is fundamentally about the dignity of human beings. Uh, it is fundamentally the human rights issue but it is also the smart and effective thing to do. And so frameworks that were put, frameworks were put in place uh, in the department uh, from the so-called QDDR, the Quadrennial Report on Diplomacy and Development, the first ever uh, time that the State Department uh, focused on a QDDR, much as the Defense Department has always done. And if one were going to read that QDDR, as I hope some of you will, who are students of what all of this represents, you will see throughout this enormous document so many references to gender in all of the ways that the State Department does its work and must continue to do this work. Also promulgated was a gender guidance policy uh, for the department uh, that mirrored what the administrator of AID promulgated for USAID so that we were working on parallel tracks in diplomacy and in development. And that guidance for the State Department uh, included 
uh, issues that may not occur that were absolutely critical to this going forward in a way that is sustainable and which I'm sure uh, is something that you all uh, are concerned about or uh, thoughtful about as, as changes occur and transitions occur in government. Uh, and that is focusing on training through the Foreign Service Institute. How are new diplomats and uh, veteran diplomats coming back for refresher courses going to understand these issues in a new way? perhaps uh, in their career in ways that they were never broached before, uh, reflecting issues of budgeting and strategic planning, uh, issues of who does these issues. Do they go to the lowest level person on the totem pole who raises usually her hand and says, I would like to do them? Uh, no, this puts in place very serious considerations uh, at the highest levels of leadership. Now, let me just... Uh, touch on a couple of issues. I sound like I have a frog in my throat because I got back from India late last night. And um, one of the things that was really such a, a rewarding moment for me was when the U.S. Ambassador to India uh, asked me to come and talk to the Gender Task Force at the Embassy in Delhi. Uh, and we had hooked up uh, through the DVCs all of the consulates across uh, India, and to have a group of people, men and women, from every office and bureau that the embassy parallels to the work in Washington, focused on these issues, uh, was extraordinarily uh, rewarding, and it was particularly inspiring for me to hear them talk about how, from consular affairs uh, to the challenges that make the headlines in India today they were working on these issues in a way uh, that carried out the gender guidance and the other policies uh, that have been promulgated. So let me just take up two, knowing that my uh, former colleague will fill in all of the blanks and really put a strong lens on the development piece. First, U.S. foreign policy and global economic growth. One of the big challenges we face all over the world is how to grow economies and how to ensure shared prosperity for all nations and all people. The World Bank has called this thank you, smart economics. Now, you might ask, how do they get there? How do we get there? Well, let's look at studies, and this is an evidence-based case. One of the things that engendered a strong focus uh, over the last four years and will continue, I am confident, is a focus on data, on evidence, on research, on studies uh, that really says when we make these statements, this is what it's based on. This is what you are about at a university, making the case uh, in very concrete ways. Now, I think many of you know that over the last years, the World Economic Forum, hardly a women's organization to be sure, issued an annual gender gap report. And they put out this report and measure in, for, in all of the countries for which there is data how much the gap between men and women in a given country is closed on four metrics, access to education, to health and survivability, to economic participation, and to political participation, political empowerment. Now, why do they do this? Because in the countries where this gap is closer to being closed, and in no country is it closed, but where it is closer to being closed, those countries are far more economically competitive uh, and prosperous. We also know that women invest up to 90% of their incomes in their families and communities, on food, on health care, on education, all of those things uh, that, that represent a multiplier effect and constitute an investment in growing the standard of living around the world. Studies also show uh, that women entrepreneurs drive uh, economic growth and our jobs creators 
in the arena of small and medium-sized businesses. That's true in the United States. SMEs are a growing engine. They are an engine uh, that accelerates growth. But women face uh, hurdles, uh, whether those hurdles have to do with access to training, uh, to mentors, to uh, technology, to markets, uh, and especially to capital. This is one of the hardest areas and one in which you're here next door to uh, the World Bank is getting a lot more focus today because we're realizing how critically important this space is. Uh, and it's been called the missing middle, uh, that you've got strong uh, mega companies and what they represent, and then you've got the world of the micro uh, entrepreneurs, the bottom of the uh, pyramid, so to speak. But it is in this middle uh, that we really need to invest uh, in order uh, for uh, women to prosper and make their contributions. And these barriers uh, also uh, are witnessed in uh, discriminatory laws and regulations, in entrenched practices. In some places, women have no right to inheritance, uh, to property. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that we really worked at trying to uh, address uh, through uh, the kinds of programs that the State Department was doing uh, in all of the relevant departments uh, to really enable uh, the uh, enable uh, revitalizing in in many cases and uh, and igniting in other cases uh, the kind of growth every country wants to see. Now, one of the ways we did that and continue to do that is through the various forums in which the United States participates. So APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, the OECD, uh, the G8, and we just had a major uh, accomplishments coming out of the G8 on these various issues, the G20, and so on and so forth, actually zeroing in on what these multilateral opportunities represent uh, to focus on women. So let me give you an example. On the agenda of, the, of APEC, rarely were there any considerations of the role that women play in the economy. These are 21 economies of perhaps the most dynamic uh, region in the world economically. And we decided that uh, with Japan's leadership at the time in 2010, moving to the United States in 2011, that we should make every effort to put these issues on the agenda. And I still remember going to Tokyo uh, in a meeting of the representatives of APEC from all of the economies and providing, provided the opportunity to make the pitch why we need to do this. And when I concluded my remarks, the first gentleman who came up to me said, oh my goodness, you talked about growth. I don't know what he expected that I would have talked about to make the case for why this was important. But I think perhaps it was the way we often talk about these issues. I would suggest rightly, fundamentally, but they were not where the resonance was, where the heavy issues of the day were being discussed and debated. And so what came out of that initial ascent was to move this issue in a very robust way. And when the United States uh, had the leadership of APEC two years ago in San Francisco, we had the first ever summit of women and the economy that included the ministers, not just women's ministers, as important as they are, but economics ministers, ministers of finance, of trade, and high-level private sector representatives to really focus on these issues. And out of that convening came the San Francisco Declaration that was later agreed to by the leaders of the economies when they gathered uh, to really put a focus on the role of women in growing SMEs uh, and dealing with the various obstacles that they confront. Similarly, we have promoted access to markets for business women through the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program. The United States has a trade agreement with many of the African countries called AGOA, the Africa Growth Opportunity Act. 
and there is a ministerial every year as we try to make progress in what this would represent between our two countries. And we found that women rarely benefit from AGOA or, for that matter, from any other trade agreements. And so we have been making a concerted effort uh, to enable women to uh, focus on becoming export ready. Uh, and uh, one of my high points uh, last year was when the ministerial was in Washington and a panel of uh, women entrepreneurs from Africa spoke truth to power as the ministers sat in front of them and they explained what, when they are able to co overcome these barriers, they are doing uh, to, gr to grow the economies of their countries. Similarly, with the OECD, we've put a huge focus on data collection, that being one of the premier entities, uh, and whether it has to do with women's education, employment, or entrepreneurship, where we need a lot more data disaggregated in ways that we can understand uh, its impacts for policy, uh, that was another push that the United States made uh, in the ministerial. So all of this and so much more underscores my primary point, which is when we liberate the economic potential of women, we elevate the economic performance of communities, of nations, and certainly our world. Now, let me mention just one more area to show you how uh, we put in place uh, policies and new ways of thinking uh, to ensure that gender considerations were providing uh, the kinds of outcomes we wanted to see in our diplomatic work. And that is in the area of women in peace and security. This is not just uh, an economic issue that we're considering this morning or a development issue, but it is an issue of global security. And as the President's national security strategy has noted, quote, experience shows us that countries are more peaceful and prosperous where women are accorded full and equal rights and opportunity. And on the other side of that equation, countries that don't, lag behind and worse. So today women are largely, regrettably, a shut out of negotiations that seek an end to conflicts as well as the decision making processes in post-conflict reconstruction and other decisions. More than half of all peace agreements, for example, fail in the first five years of enactment. So clearly we understand we need to focus uh, in some new ways, and one of those critical ways was to energize what the United Nations Security Council uh, decided uh, more than a decade ago in what has become called 1325, Resolution 1325, that linked women to peace and security. And Dece in December of uh, uh, 2011, uh, President Obama launched the first ever United States National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, accompanied by an executive order uh, which provides a roadmap uh, for us to accelerate and institutionalize efforts across our government at the table in the White House for more than a year. And Don Steinberg led the effort for USAID, which was a major player uh, at the table, as was state, as was uh, DOD, and several of the other agencies, uh, because we understood that to advance women's participation in making and keeping peace uh, was necessary through our diplomatic, military, and development efforts. And this affects everything we do today, whether it's in Afghanistan, uh, whether it's in, in Nepal, uh, whether it's in the DRC, uh, or in Sudan, or in so many places that capture the headlines every single day. This is an issue uh, that is to affect uh, how we go about doing our work. Now, some 30 countries came ahead of the United States. They had already developed uh, their national action plan, as did NATO. 
uh, and it is having the kind of uh, impact um, that it should have in the work of countries that they uh, do uh, in areas of going through massive political transformation like the post so-called Arab Spring countries uh, and areas in conflict. This National Action Plan has four pillars, just so you know how extensive it is. Uh, women in conflict prevention. Women are, women are like the canaries in the mines. If you don't pay attention to the condition of women, which is almost the first line of attack by those who want to bring about malevolent change, we are going to pay a bigger price down the line uh, as the situation in those countries, in those places becomes more unstable and much more uh, conflict-driven. Uh, so what we can do in those situations and the signs we need to look for and the kinds of actions we need to provide. Secondly, women's participation in peace negotiations. Uh, we've seen from Northern Ireland to Liberia how women come together to build a durable peace and the issues they put on the table uh, that don't get on the table because they are considering uh, whether it's economic issues or human rights issues, the kinds of things that rarely get the consideration and perhaps explain why peace agreements break down so, uh, so often because the real issues that have to be dealt with to create a better future in those places uh, never really get considered and prioritized in ways that they need to. Thirdly, the need for protection of women. Uh, women are seldom the cause of conflict, but they are more often than not today the bearers of the consequences of the combat. And indeed, many strategies today by the armed combatants are focused directly on women uh, and rape being uh, among the, the top ways in which that is done. Violence against women needs to be addressed in the framework of women, peace, and security. And finally, as uh, consideration must be given to women as key actors in post-conflict uh, reconstruction from economic development to humanitarian assistance to their kinds of input in design and uh, development of the kinds of programs that will make a difference as they move in their areas from instability to stability, from conflict to hopefully sustainable peace. And I often thought about this in the days that I was at State uh, because after my first trip to uh, Afghanistan uh, in this position, I was left with some words that many of you have heard me say in the past that stay with me to this day and that was one night in Kabul with a group of women leaders uh, one of them said to me at the outset of a discussion, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And I think too often we look at women solely through the prism of victimhood. Now they are in many ways uh, the bearers of, of all kinds of egregious acts against them, uh, but they also are uh, those who have to uh, make the difference uh, at the leadership people, at the leadership table. Uh, and if they are silenced or if they are marginalized, the prospects for a sustainable peace uh, are going to be subverted, which is why the United States has and continues to make uh, the kind of concerted effort that we have to bring women from Afghanistan into all of the international conferences, into the Loya Jirgas, uh, into the High Peace Council uh, as decisions are being made uh, about the economic transition and the political transition uh, in that country. So much has been achieved in many ways. A um, platform for action of sorts has been adopted. Uh, and I think the prospects for sustainability uh, are, are absolutely uh, ones that uh, we can all feel uh, will, will be there in a positive way. One of the first 
actions uh, that were made uh, just before Secretary Kerry uh, came into his position uh, in succeeding Secretary Clinton uh, was on her last visit to the White House uh, in an official capacity. The President signed uh, in her presence a presidential memorandum making the position of Ambassador for Global Women's Issues a permanent position and laying out why that was important to do. Uh, in his confirmation hearings, Secretary Kerry fielded many questions uh, in this area from senators on both sides of the aisle uh, having to do with Afghanistan and the office and so much more. Uh, and I must say the very first day uh, that Secretary Kerry took over in the State Department, uh, we had visiting us a group of women from Burma and there was certainly tremendous interest in my office to have him meet with the women as it was for them to have this opportunity as Burma goes through an historic transition. Uh, and he immediately said, yes, I will meet with them. I uh, had an extraordinarily positive conversation with them. Uh, and I watched as he relayed it uh, to them uh, and so admirably and smartly talked to them about the challenges that they were confronting and the role that they needed to play. And if any of you followed his most recent trip uh, to Afghanistan uh, in this role, having been there many times before, uh, he did two visits with women entrepreneurs who are going to be on the front lines of moving the economy of Afghanistan forward. And I know what an impact it had, I heard, uh, both from our embassy representatives as well as the women themselves, what it meant to have the new secretary uh, because many of them didn't know what the change, what the transition represented for them and what they saw was consistency uh, in U.S. foreign policy. And coming out of the G8 uh, that was, uh, uh, ha that just happened last week, an extraordinary declaration uh, from the top eight countries that gather in that, in that platform uh, on sexual gender-based violence and areas of conflict, which has been uh, a major push of the United States, is certainly at the, with the leadership of the UK uh, and others, as well as going through that document and seeing the recognition of how important uh, women are to addressing some of the challenges that the leaders were concerning themselves with including the need to grow SMEs uh, in the post-Arab Spring countries uh, and the role that women need to play and to be resourced to play uh, in that position. Strategic dialogues continue uh, between countries and uh, women's empowerment is a critical element in many of those dialogues. Uh, memorandums of understanding have been drawn up between uh, countries on bilateral agreements that include uh, a focus on various women's priorities. So the everyday work of the State Department goes on uh, and hopefully it will only continue to grow and demonstrate how important these issues are uh, to that work uh, as the United States uh, plays its leadership role on the uh, platform uh, of the world. And let me just say finally for those of you who aren't in government that today you have tools that you didn't have to hold government responsible. Whether it's the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, uh, whether it's the kind of uh, programs that have put in place uh, on the economy or it is something I didn't have time even to, to uh, discuss, which was a new executive order that the President issued on dealing with gender-based violence, certainly a global epidemic uh, all around the world. So our ultimate goal is as simple as it is profound to empower half the world's population as an equal partner in preventing conflict and building lasting peace, in growing economies, in providing for our own global security. As the Nobel uh, Peace Prize Committee said two years ago when it uh, gave the Peace Prize to three women, we cannot achieve democracy and lasting peace in the world unless women have the same opportunities as men to influence the developments at all levels of society. Uh, so the work goes on. 
uh, this is not just the right thing to do, but it is the smart and strategic thing to do. Thank you all so much, and thank you to GW for bringing us all together. So it's always uh, difficult to follow Milan. I, in the old days, I used to just get up here and say "ditto" and sit down. But uh, you know, uh, Sean was describing what he thinks I do at USAID. But for the past two and a half years, my real job has been to uh, fund and to implement all of the crazy, audacious, and inspirational ideas that Secretary Clinton and Milan Bevere uh, could come up with. And uh, it has been a, a proud tradition to, uh, to fill that role. Uh, in my comments this morning, uh, what I really wanted to do was simply to uh, take away the question mark at the end of the uh, title of this seminar. Hillary Clinton and Global Women's Issues, an Enduring Legacy, question mark. I would take that away. This is an enduring legacy that we all feel. Uh, when I first got to USAID, literally the second day I was there, I was in a meeting with uh, Secretary Clinton about the uh, legendary quadrennial diplomacy and development review. And she made it clear that what this document was largely about, as far as AID was concerned, was the concept of inclusive development. The concept that development isn't just 6 and 8 and 10 percent growth rates, that it has to matter to people, that it has to be reflected in good jobs and in uh, equitable distribution of income, that it has to be reflected in health and education and housing. But more importantly, she said, it also has to not only address the needs, but draw on the contributions of previously marginalized groups. And number one on that list was women. There were others, youth, the LGBT community, people with disabilities, indigenous populations. But when she talked about women, she made it clear that we needed to address a number of uh, gaps that existed. And in particular, as Milan has described, women's participation in peace processes, uh, protection for women when social order breaks down, as in conflict situations or humanitarian disasters, trafficking in young girls, issues related to domestic violence, issues, as Milan has described, regarding the empowerment of women, looking at women not as victims but as the key to economic and social and political development. That was a pretty uh, robust agenda to give someone on his second day in the office. Uh, but we have, uh, we have proceeded uh, on this road. And what we have uh, addressed is three aspects of this. Uh, first, people, then policies, and then programs. On the people side, the very first thing I did was to ask Carla Coppell to come to USAID as our senior coordinator for women's empowerment and uh, gender equality, the best hire we ever made. Uh, we then asked Karen Grone to come in, the best economist, sorry, at American University in gender issues. We brought Sarah Mendelson in, who is a human rights advocate for gender issues. We elevated Kay Freeman within our system to head our new GenDev office. And what we essentially did was to create a dream team that then used its capacity to energize the entire agency of USAID. And they engaged in training. We indicated that every post needed to have a gender coordinator. And as Milan was saying, 
not the youngest person at the mission, but a senior person who had the capacity to influence how we were doing our resource allocation and how we were using our people. We put in place a uh, requirement that every single project that we do, before we even consider it, has to have a gender impact statement. It has to describe exactly how this is going to help empower women. And we got a few of them early on, you know, a dam project that said, this will help women because half of the water that comes from this dam will be consumed by women. <laughs> and I said, mm, not exactly. I said, have you analyzed what the impact of this is going to be on the displaced people and what the social networks that you're destroying are? Have you thought about the fact that the vast majority of the people who are going to be employed in producing this dam, creating the dam, are men? And so what's that going to do to the local labor market? Have you considered the possibility of using the energy that comes from that dam to provide households with the capability to cook inside without firewood? And we all know that two million women and children die each year from respiratory illnesses associated with breathing smoke inside their houses from cooking with wood. All you have to do is a couple of those sort of like, I'm not going to accept this, and people start to change. The other thing we did was a set of policies because, frankly, we looked back and we realized that our basic policies on gender were about two decades old. And so under the leadership of our Policy Planning and Learning Bureau, we put together the following policies. A policy on countering trafficking in persons that was matched with a very strong code of conduct that said for our people, for our contractors, for our subcontractors, if we catch you doing things in this space, you will be debarred and suspended, or if it's an uh, employee of USAID, you'll be fired. We put together a massive uh, plan for gender equality and female empowerment. We indeed put together our implementation plan for the National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security. We put together a strategy to prevent gender-based violence globally. And most recently, last October, we put together our vision for ending child marriage and meeting the needs of married children. These were very conscious policies, all of which included not only the resources necessary to get the job done, but time-bound goals, strict monitoring and evaluation provisions, and perhaps most importantly, a listing of who was responsible, whose career is going to be either enhanced or hurt because that policy was implemented. And unless you have that degree of accountability, you're not going to succeed in these processes. So I wanted to then talk about the, the programs that we're actually doing. And I thought the easiest way to do this was to give you a little bit of a travel log. Uh, from what I've seen when I go out to the field. And when we talk about the lasting legacy of Hillary Clinton and Milan Vivere, it is reflected in the fact that people are taking this seriously throughout my agency. It is now in the DNA of my agency, and I want to describe a few of the visits that I've made. In April of 2011, I had the opportunity to go to Afad University, which is that amazing women's university in the middle of Khartoum. And there, the women came and told me about the problems that they had had in integrating themselves in the Darfur peace process and in the North-South process. So I came back and talked with Carla, who immediately found $14 million and we put together a program to empower women to participate in peace processes all around the world. We're providing them training, we're providing them stipends, and we're providing them physical protection. 
because we all know that the most dangerous profession in the world is a woman peace builder. Shortly after that, I went out to Dolo Adu uh, refugee camp in Kenya. There were literally tens of thousands of Somali refugees who were flooding across the border. And in most of these situations around the world, the needs of women are basically ignored. What you generally will hear from relief workers is, we don't have time to set up separate latrines for men and women. We don't have time to focus on reproductive health care. We're just trying to save lives here. But this was different. They understood that unless you address gender issues at that first point, you're going to create a situation where women are disempowered, abused, and you're just adding to the tragedy. And again, I have to say it was largely the efforts of Carla, who traveled out to the region and helped genderize all of the relief efforts. And UNHCR took it very, very seriously. The High Commissioner for Refugees focuses on this issue in a number of situations. We're not doing as well globally, and I can describe a lot of scare stories uh, from the experience, but that was one success. Shortly after that, I went to San Luis Robles, which is on the coast of Colombia. And I met with Afro-Colombian women there who were participating in our rural development projects. And we have focused on women as a key in all of our agricultural programs. There's this amazing statistic that if you could assure women of the same access to capital, credit, fertilizer, land, seeds, that men have, you would actually increase agricultural production by 30% globally, and you'd feed 300 million people. And so in this program, what we were doing was providing alternative crop opportunities for these women. And it was the first time they had ever stood up to the narco traffickers. It was the first time they had ever stood up to the FARC. And they went into the public square to, to greet us as we arrived. And they had signs saying, enough is enough. We stand up. The FARC is not going to be able to intimidate us anymore. We have our own income here. Uh, subsequent trip, I do spend a lot of time on the road, by the way, was, was to the, the Philippines. And we went out to Batangas, where we have a program that helps give women land title. You know, it is a very serious problem all around the world that women do not have ten land tenure. And what it means is you can't access capital, you have no land security, you are uncertain as to whether you can make investments in your own property. And so we have a program where we're giving away 70,000 land titles to women. And in Batangas in the Philippines, I was handing out some of these. And one woman grabbed my hand, and she just wouldn't let go. And she, you know, and I'm starting to get a little scared, actually. And she says, I just have to tell you my story. She said, I was married at a very young age. My husband died about five years later. He never bothered to transfer the land title to me. For the last 25 years, I've been raising our children uncertain as to whether by the end of the day I will be thrown off this land. I haven't been able to invest in the land because no one will give me credit. And even if they did, if I improved the land too much, land grabbers would come. She said, this single piece of paper changes my life. And then she started to cry. And then I started to cry. And we all got a little weepy. So shortly after that, uh, in July of 2012, I went to Tokyo for the Afghan Reconstruction Conference. And I saw the handiwork of Milan Bavir as well as our mission out there. You know, what we heard from women civil society participants, and it was the first time women had come in mass numbers. And Milan and I actually met with these women. And they were standing up for the right to participate in a post 
uh, conflict period. They were essentially saying, don't sacrifice us on the altar of a settlement with the Taliban. And what they reminded us was that we are not going to fight our way out of Afghanistan. We're going to develop our way out of Afghanistan. We can set up all the police forces and the military training and all those exercises, but what really matters is that over the last 10 years, we've seen a 60% decline in infant mortality in Afghanistan. What really matters is that 2001, there were no girls in school, and today there are almost 3 million. And perhaps most stunning to me, the life expectancy of a woman today has gone up 15 years in just a decade. 47 years life expectancy in 2001. Now it's 62 years. And if you think about that as the most stabilizing influence, uh, then you understand how this all comes together. Two more very quick stories. Recent trip was out to Denver, Colorado. And what I saw there was a group of students who were working in a program that we're supporting to fight trafficking in people. They're indeed thinking globally and acting locally. And they have linked up with kids at universities all around the, uh, this country on a project. What they've identified is that you can take your cell phone to Walmart or Target, put it up against the barcode of a product, pull it back, and it will tell you exactly how much traffic labor was involved in producing that good. You know, it is... Uh, frankly, very simple to produce that capability. What the students are doing all around this country is the data collection, to put it in there. And it is already having an impact. Uh, there are companies that are saying, wait a second, I don't want to be listed as, as a violator of, of, of trafficking provisions. And they're responding uh, in that area. Uh, if it works for this, which we fully expect it to, we're going to apply it to child labor. Then we're going to apply it to conflict minerals. Then we're going to apply it to traffic, uh, to tropical forest deforestation. And eventually what you're going to have is a social indicator, a socially corporate responsibility indicator on your cell phone. And it'll change the way we mark, we shop, it'll change the way we uh, produce goods. So my final trip that I wanted to describe was just about six, six eight weeks ago, and I've, I've uh, told this story in front of Milan a number of times, and again, this was in part a, uh, a direct uh, outcome of Hillary Clinton asking us to respond to domestic violence in Central America. You may be aware that Following the wars that occurred, the civil wars, the violence against women quotient just rose incredibly. It's reflected in huge numbers of femicide, but it's also just in domestic violence. And so we have linked up with uh, the incredible Attorney General, Claudia Pazzi Paz, and one of the things that we've done is to create what they call the 24-hour court. Because in Guatemala, you have to report a personal crime against you within six hours of the actual occurrence. And so if you had a domestic violence incident late at night, the court was closed, you didn't have an option. Uh, so this court is truly amazing. It's a large up building downtown. You go in the front door. If you go to the right, it's a normal sort of police station. You go to the left, First person you see is a doctor, and that doctor takes care of you medically. Next person you see is a policeman, and the policeman files your charge. You then go and see the judge, and you get the, uh, the process moving. Then you go to a psychosocial counselor, and you start trying to deal immediately with the challenge that you're facing. And finally, the last station is a counselor who will tell you what your options are. 
some cases you have to go back to your home. In other cases, you can go to a safe house. They'll figure out what they can do for you. And the difference between when a woman would walk in the front door and then when they were at the end of this process was like night and day. But the other thing we did in Guatemala was to go out to a small village. And this was a, a city called, a village called Nibaj in the highlands. And in that area, we've been working with indigenous women who are standing up against domestic violence in their communities. And so for the past three years, they have been lobbying their governor and their mayor. They have been appearing on national television. They've been providing support to each other. They are a movement. And many of them are illiterate, but they are out there publicly. And as thrilling as that was, the most exciting event in that sequence was when a man stood up in the middle of our meeting. And he said, uh, you know, I joined this group two years ago because when I was a kid, uh, I would watch my dad beat my mom. And it was constant. And I was powerless to do anything about it. I was just a kid. Uh, I felt emasculated. And then I grew up. And I got married, and in order to prove that I was a man, I started beating my wife. And I did it for many, many years. And then I joined this group, and last year my wife gave birth to a, a young boy. And I held that kid in my arm. I looked down and I said, enough is enough. This has got to stop, and it stops with me. And so if you think about the legacy of Hillary Clinton, it is the woman with the title in a land title in the Philippines. It is the kids on the college campus at University of Denver. It is the women at a FOD university in Khartoum. And yes, it's that man who has changed his life in Nabaj, Guatemala. Thank you. Thank you, but no fair making me choke up right before I have to talk. So um, uh, thank you. That was wonderful, both of you. Um, I definitely want to have time for, for questions, but um, I have a, a couple of my own uh, as we get started here. Um, you both did a wonderful job of laying out what's been accomplished, and I particularly was interested in the way in which uh, you focused on how it's been institutionalized, the empiricism the incentive structure, all of that. What hurdles have you not been able to overcome? What challenges remain that, you know, this is, this is something that didn't start with Hillary Clinton or Milan Verbeer, but it's uh, something that is a relatively new focus. Um, things don't change overnight. So what, what is left? that we need, that the major issues that need to be dealt with, institutionally and otherwise? Uh, well, first of all, Sean, I think one point you made uh, is a very important one, and that is that it didn't start with Hillary Clinton. It certainly has grown uh, exponentially. Uh, but back in the 90s, for example, when Madeleine Albright was secretary and the first lady at the time, Hillary Clinton, was traveling so much globally and representing the United States on these issues, uh, there, there was no information. So if you think that in the 90s, not that long ago, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't, as a typical uh, expectation, have a report from embassies or from the regional bureaus about what the status of girls' education was, what the status uh, of violence against women was. None of those issues were really uh, even discussed, uh, let alone reported on. Uh, secondly, this became very, very clear to me um, with respect to DRL, the Human Rights uh, Department at State, uh, when several of the staffers had said they thought they should work on FGM, female genital mutilation or cutting, which is certainly viewed today as a, a violation of human rights. And they were told, no, it's not a human rights issue. Uh, and it wasn't until the then First Lady made a big uh, statement, as I mentioned, on these issues, that gradually these changes came. 
So, and there were women's offices. There was a women's office when I was in the White House uh, that we worked with in the State Department, but it was more on the outskirts of what was going on than at the center of what was going on. But I think it's important to know that there were small steps that were being taken mm -hmm. uh, on these issues. Uh, and certainly AID was making investments that were critical. As I look at uh, how far we've come, uh, particularly in the last four years and what remains to be done, uh, I think you very um, succinctly explained where, the, where things are. A lot of this in my experience is retail. If Don and I could go to every embassy and meet with every group of staff all over the world and cover much of our foreign service, I have no doubt uh, that by the time we concluded that, everybody would be close to being on the same page. Not because we said so, but because it becomes very vivid as to what a difference it makes. And you begin to have these personal experiences around the world of what a policy difference we were able to make because we incorporated these issues. And so if you're still removed from that uh, and you're uh, solely implementing policies, which not for a second do I underestimate, it's critical. But I think this is an evolutionary process and it will take more time until it really uh, seeps into the MO of every uh, practitioner in our civil service, in our foreign service, uh, in the work that AID uh, and defense do on women and security for it to have the kind of impact it can have. Uh, I completely agree with what Milan just said. Uh, I think we have penetrated, uh, as I said, people, policies, and programs. But there are three areas that I th think remain. One is to persuade people that this is indeed a cross-cutting issue, that this has to be integrated not just as separate programs for women's empowerment, but then in our food security programs, that they have to focus on women farmers, women traders, women throughout the supply chain. In our health programs, there has to be a special emphasis on uh, gender-based violence, on reproductive health care, uh, and a recognition of the role that women play in changing household behaviors. Uh, the same would be true in economic growth. It's not just a question of microenterprise. It's a question of changing the nature of society so that women have access to major capital, that women are serving on boards and as uh, company presidents. We obviously have this challenge in this country as well. Uh, and in, in the social arena as well, making sure that women's organizations are firm and solid. But secondly, we have a challenge of walking the walk in-house. We all serve at agencies that still have glass ceilings, even if uh, the Secretary of State uh, has for many, many years been a woman. Uh, that's not reflected below the, the top levels. We still have uh, discrimination that exists in terms of recruitment, in terms of promotions, in terms of the assignment process, in terms of the separation process. And so we have to start walking the walk in-house. And then finally, what we need to ensure is that at the highest levels of government, at the staff meetings that occur at embassies overseas, that someone is standing up in each of those meetings and taking the very difficult step of saying, how does this impact on women? Uh, and it's, it's a bigger challenge than people understand because you're sitting around talking about these hard issues of national security. And to have to remind people at that table that their great programs are not going to succeed unless women are engaged. Milan gave a, an excellent quote from the national security strategy. And I would just want to take it one step further. Countries that are respectful of women that are, as Milan said, prosperous and democratic. Remember, those countries don't tend to traffic in drugs, in people, and in weapons. They don't transmit pandemic diseases. They don't send off huge numbers of refugees across borders or oceans. 
They don't harbor terrorists or pirates now, and they don't require American troops on the ground. And that's national security. Can I, can I just add, Sean, to um, one thing that Don said? It's not to underestimate the power of symbol. Having someone uh, in his situation, a male leader, put these issues on the front burner. You know, everybody expected Hillary Clinton was going to raise these issues when she got into a bilateral meeting or was with a group of her counterparts. Uh, but that's why I think it's so powerful when Secretary Kerry does now, uh, because he now takes this to a level beyond the expectation, to be sure, because this is not what is expected, and says this matters. Just as Don has done in, in all of the ways that he has done it in his travels, but most more importantly, um, in the way that he's been able to do it at the high level of White House uh, critical meetings or, or multi-departmental uh, uh, meetings within our own government. It does make a difference. So <clears throat> thinking forward four years from now, um, what kinds of things should we look for as indications that this progress that you both just described that, that still remains to be made, including, I thought it was an excellent point, institutionally, mm -hmm. the glass ceilings that still remain, um, four years from now, what would we look at and say, oh, here's, here's solid evidence that, in fact, it isn't a question mark, it's a period? Well, personally, or an exclamation point. I, I think it, a lot of it has to do with uh, the policies that have been made and how they're implemented and enforced and effectuated. You know, I go all around the world and uh, take the issue of gender-based violence. What do I hear? ad nauseum every place, and you see the results of not doing it, is that, oh, we passed a law in our country. It's never been enforced. It's never been implemented. Four years from now, if we all came back and said, oh, we had a national action plan on women, peace, and security, how did that make a difference in the Department of Defense with respect to our training programs, what happens to women in the military, what happens in peacekeeping missions? What is AID doing? Are they doing the kinds of things uh, with the food security initiative, the major Obama administration initiative, understanding that in many places women are the majority of the small farmers. Did what Don said about equalizing resources actually happen? Uh, in so many of these areas, if you don't have implementation at all of the levels, we will not make the kind of progress we need to make. So I think it is to really begin to track uh, what is happening, and that's where civil society, where academicians, where people like those of you in this room uh, have a really important role to play, uh, journalists, uh, to hold all of us who uh, are in government accountable. Two quick responses. One is that we are being very diligent about establishing monitoring and evaluation practices as well as concrete time-bound goals. And so in everything that we're doing, whether it's in, take agriculture for one, uh, Karen Grohn and her team put together this amazing document called the Women's uh, Agricultural Empowerment Index. And it is a means of actually seeing in a community whether women have been empowered in the agricultural sector to make decisions, to, uh, to spend resources, et cetera. It has taken over. It is now being adopted by the World Bank, the United Nations. It's just you know going like gang fire around the world. We need similar programs, which we are putting now into effect right across the board, uh, so that we have actual metrics that show us whether we're, we're doing what we need to. Actually, I'm going to make three points. The second point is it has to be into the DNA. So you can get that evidentiary side, but it also, you have to have the anecdotes. And I, was, I, I use an expression all the time, nothing about them without them. And it's intended to say, don't think you're going to walk in and tell a woman in you know, a rural village in the Central African Republic what you can do for her. Listen to her. And I was just in Bangladesh, and I had one of our junior officers at AID, unaware that I 
have been using that phrase said to me, you know, we have a phrase we use around here, nothing about them without them. <laughs> and I said, wow. <laughs> okay, we, we've succeeded. The third, and I, I, I hate to be personal with the audience right now, but the third uh, metric would be that we would have a 50-50 audience right now. I was thinking that earlier. Yeah. And <laughs> we don't. And so this is still perceived as a women's issue or a gender issue. It isn't. As I was just saying, this is a national security issue, as Milan has argued. It is an economic growth issue. It is an international stability issue. And uh, I'm it is invariably the case when I when I speak to audiences, it's about 85 percent women, and it has to be 50-50. And I just make um, one point. I was sitting here thinking that one of the first discussions I was ever involved in in my uh, in the job I just left uh, was with Interaction, and these are the development experts uh, from the United States who relate to their counterparts around the world. And I'll never forget a question from the audience, which was, well, it's fine for you to say all of this, but we know where the money is. The money's at AID. And how are they going <laughs> to implement this? Where are they going to put their investments? Uh, so y you see, you have to really look at this at all levels of implementation. And then the second thing, because you are a university, and it's part of what uh, my new mission is to do over at Georgetown, is we need this to be the anecdotal. We need to know the stories. We need to know how people are impacted. But we don't have enough of the data, and everything today is data-driven. I can sit with a leader of a country and talk about that wonderful project I just saw where, where women are transforming their lives thanks to the investment that's been made. But when I talk about the hard evidence, uh, the, the research data that shows his country cannot begin to move forward unless X, Y, and Z happens, data-driven. It does matter. And so I encourage a lot more scholarship and research on these issues at a place like this. And Mary, I know, will be leading the charge. But it really does matter. Well, you know, you mentioned that it's not a women's uh, to paraphrase, it's right. not a women's issue. We should have, you know, a 50-50 split and all that. But you're also talking about funding. And I'm wondering, do you think that this has evolved to a point where it's a, where you have bipartisan support? Because when you talk about data, especially as a scholar of political communication, political science, where Congress just X'd out NSF funding for political science, data doesn't always sway members of Congress. So how do, you have both been in this fight for so long with different administrations and different partisan makeups, has this evolved to the point where you have bipartisan support in Congress to get the kind of funding that you need for USAID projects and other sorts of projects um, or not? Well, I think there's two questions here. One is um, generally uh, in terms of, let's call it foreign assistance, um, this has been an area for which, I, for reasons I have never really understood, one always has a hard case to make. Why the work of AID, State Department, et cetera, needs to be fully supported in the interest of the United States. Um, you know, this was always attacked the way welfare queens used to be attacked. It's still, well, at a time when we have all of these needs, why are we doing X, Y, and Z in all the places that, that Don mentioned? Uh, and the reality is, is because it is about us, our own security, uh, and our own interests, and we need to grasp that. And that, you know, has been back and forth between both political parties. Uh, on the, the women's piece of that, assuming that is addressed, I have not found a major difference between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. Uh, some of our, our strongest supporters have been on one side of the aisle that where you may not always expect to see support on these kinds of issues. So I, I think that's not the challenge so much. The challenge is much more a fundamental one um, where uh, we have to appreciate why these kinds of investments generally uh, in terms of our global diplomatic and uh, 
development work matter. I remember one of the strongest arguments was made by Secretary Gates uh, in the previous term when he said, you know, we can have all the military power in the world. We can have, spend all that we can spend, but the truth of the matter is we cannot consign the military uh, to every place in the world. And if we don't address these problems at their roots, uh, where it matters, where we can have a tangible impact before worse situations develop, we, have, we will have failed to do our jobs. And it's that recognition across the board in development and diplomacy that I think we have to keep making. You know, if you talk to the average American and ask them how much we're spending on quote unquote foreign assistance, 10%, maybe more, it's less than 1%. Uh, but yet think of how valuable that is in all that we do around the world. I, I think there is a myth out there that Congress is stingy in this space, and the reality is that we continue to see robust budgets for foreign assistance, uh, uh, not as robust as I would like. I would love to have the 10% that Milan was just referring to. But uh, in reality, we have a pretty sophisticated, pretty savvy Congress that gets that it, this is indeed in our security interest, in our national value structure. They also get that this is in our economic interest. Thirteen of our fastest growing 20 markets around the world are AID countries. And that's because, I mean, if you think about where the growth is going to come in the future, it's not in Europe. And it's not in Japan. It's in these developing countries. And if we can get them prosperous and moving rapidly ahead. The other thing I would say, though, is increasingly it's not about the money. Increasingly it is about what you're doing with that money, whether you're leveraging your resources through the private sector, through non-governmental organizations, whether you're using your convening authority. Uh, you know, I, I have to do a pitch right now because we have a new proposal on the Hill uh, to change the way we do food aid. Uh, we have for a long time had food aid dependent $1.4 billion bought from American farmers, shipped on American cargo vessels, it takes six to nine months to get it into emergency situations. The routes they take are, you know, all around the world. Uh, and we have estimated that if you could take that same amount of money and put it into direct purchases of food, either on the ground or in the region, still you'd buy a lot from the United States. But if you had that freedom, you would save over the course of the next decade $4 billion, or preferably you would feed 2 to 4 million more people each year. So we put this idea out there. Uh, it is in the president's budget, and just to follow up on the bipartisan aspect, we have everything from the most liberal senators to John Bolton and the AEI that are supportive of this initiative. So I really don't believe it's a partisan issue about foreign aid. I think it's a recognition that it is indeed in our national security interest. My last question before we go out. I what advice do you have for your successor to be successful and carry on so that four years from now this is an exclamation point? Well, um, the president has nominated Kathy Russell to succeed me. Uh, she has been a longtime operative uh, on Capitol Hill, so she knows the Congress. And she most recently uh, has been chief of staff to uh, Dr. Biden. Uh, and I think the fact that Kathy has worked in the White House is going to serve her in good stead on these issues uh, because she will have that connection at the highest levels of the administration, uh, which I think will uh, put a, a, a strong prod in continuing to factor these issues in across the board. Secondly, to her directly, uh, as I have uh, said to her, I've known her for many, many years, uh, is that for her to operate um, in the strongest way that she can internally. Uh, because at its fundamental importance, this position is an integrative position. I wish the day would come when we wouldn't need it, when we wouldn't need that extra push within the building uh, to really focus on these issues, that we would do it 
as part of the DNA. Uh, but we're not there. And I think for her to continue to work with her colleagues at all levels across all issue areas is absolutely critical. And then the second piece is representational. Uh, not for a second to underestimate what it means to have a person who is an ambassador for the United States, who around the world can stand on a platform representing the greatest country in the world and say these issues matter uh, to people who do not hold these issues in many places uh, at the level of importance that they need to for their own sakes. Uh, that is not uh, anything but a critical part. So I think this job is one that one has to do everything one can internally with its colleagues uh, in the State Department and on the interagency level and then representationally. I have an answer as well. It's a very simple answer. Make sure her office phone has a speed dial from Milan Revere. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'll do very well. Uh, Time for a few. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I s sort of have to leave. That's I've got to understand. <laughs> All right. We will say adieu to you. Um, but as he's demiking, uh, questions for Ambassador. We have a mic going around. Yeah. Can I just say one of the points while we're getting ready? Uh, one of the points that um, Don had alluded to Carla Capel who has, and she's standing up to walk out with, with Don. Uh, she has played a significant role in the department on these issues. And whether it comes to my successor or just generally State Department and AID working together, to be uh, in constant touch with her and the role that she plays writ large at AID is another one of those essential operative norms. Thanks, Carla. You're great. So, quickly, a time for a couple of quick questions. And we'll bring you a mic. In fact, we've answered everything. Oh, there we go. Congratulations to your excellent presentation, particularly to the work that you have achieved. You have mentioned a lot of survival skills and advances in that respect in what I would still refer to as the developing countries. What do you think about the needs in the developed countries? I'm from Europe, for instance, and we know that education is the way how Europe gained everything in society. This is the base of evolution, but now with the economic crisis, education is dropped from the list. It's highly underfinanced, and I still think that education is a major issue, could be a major issue for women, not only because most of the teachers used to be women, not only because mothers are teaching their kids, but also because we see that women have a more intensive interest in higher level education. So there are more female students at the universities. So there is a dynamic there. Could we advance that topic education by connecting it more tightly to a women's issue in society? Well, I think certainly we know that uh, the most effective development tool uh, in terms of a country's own development uh, is to educate a girl. Because when you educate a girl, you educate a family. As you said, mothers as the first teachers of their children. Uh, you educate the community. And we have all of this research and data today that show us the positive outgrowths of that investment. It is a very high yield investment. You know, when you're on a plane, as I was uh, yesterday for about 16 hours, you get to read a lot of the newspapers when you're dozing off in other ways. And there was a a story I read in, in FT about how in the developed world, where we're having such an economic challenge, whether in Europe or even in the United States, uh, we need to match skills to the jobs and the jobs of the future. And the jobs of the future in the developed world are going to come in areas where you require uh, high levels of education. Uh, and whether it's those kinds of investments that need to be made more smartly. In terms of women, for example, 
example, so-called STEM uh, in science, technology, engineering, and, and math, we see fewer and fewer girls entering those fields. I, something happens at the age of 11 or 12 where these subject matters become the nerdy things or the things that a girl shouldn't do instead of being areas in, that she should embrace so that she can make her way and, and enter the 21st century job world in a successful way. So I think you're right uh, that whether it's what we know about the developing world and where we have all come as a result of education in our so-called developed world, uh, education has been a big prod for that. You know, the, what the GI Bill did in the United States uh, focused on all those returning veterans all of those decades ago really created our middle class. Uh, and that's, that's how fundamental education is. And whether it's here, looking at the cuts in, you mentioned, you know, what's happening today with science grants. Uh, I know over at Georgetown, the students are co so concerned about what's happening with Sequester uh, on some of their support programs. This has to be a top priority. Uh, but then I think there's a second issue when it comes to women, that women are graduating at increasingly high levels as graduate students, for example. I think they're the majority. And yet, when it comes to jobs in, say, the private sector or even in government, they can go so far and then they're stuck at that, call it a sticky floor, call it a glass ceiling, call it whatever. But we're not really taking those talents and experiences and pushing them into areas of more significant leadership where they can have uh, a larger difference. This is a big debate in Europe. Uh, it's certainly a debate with respect to boards of directors. Um, uh, so we have our own challenges, and I'm asked all the time, well, what's it like for women in the United States? What are some of the pressing challenges? Uh, in the United States, for example, we have no p paid maternity leave. We are the only developed country, so-called, that doesn't have paid maternity leave. We have huge issues with affordable child care at a time when women now comprise just about half of the workforce in the United States. Uh, so we all have to look at ourselves and what more we should be doing uh, as we work to uh, grow progress in our own countries. We have a great next panel, and you've been very generous with your time. So uh, I'm going to stop there. But thank you so much, Ambassador Roger. It was wonderful. And, uh, <laughs>